Hello everyone and welcome to Felix's Space Time. In today's video we have an interview with Thomas Burkhart, the news director for NASA Space Flight. If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Same type, we're go flight. Okay, we're go. We're go, same type, we're go. Thank you so, so much for coming on here for an interview. For those who do not know you, can you tell everyone a bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So my name is Thomas Burkhart. I am better known as the news director for nasaspaceflight.com, which is a space news website. We cover a lot of spaceflight events all around the world. Um, I'm also an aerospace engineer working at the Space Utilization of Innovative Technology Lab or SUIT Lab at Embry-Riddle University in Florida. Brilliant. It's lovely to meet you and um, to talk to you. Can you talk um, in um, a bit more in depth about um, what your job at NASA Space Flight entails you to do? Yeah, absolutely. So as news director, I am in charge of kind of coordinating all of our different aspects of our coverage of across a whole bunch of different space flight events and programs and things like that. Um, a lot of my time is spent mostly around our written news articles. So I work with a team of a bunch of uh, article editors and a lot of writers who write up all of the important news that are hap that's happening over the course of, you know, every single week. And, you know, when launches are happening or when uh, new announcements are made, we write those up for kind of adding some context and providing the news stories about what's going on in the space flight industry. Uh, we cover primarily American space flight, but also international space flight in Europe, in Asia, um, elsewhere, um, kind of cover any any orbital launch that happens around the world, we cover in, with a written news article, um, in addition to different news stories that come out here and there. Um, I also work a lot on the broadcast side of things. So I help with a team of producers and commentators that work for NASA Space Flight to bring live coverage to a lot of events. And that's primarily here in the United States. We cover orbital launches from here at Cape Canaveral, which is near where I live. Um, also launches out in Vandenberg in California. We cover a lot of live testing and flight events from SpaceX's facility in Starbase, Texas. Um, and then we also travel to some other less frequently used uh, launch ranges here in the United States. Uh, we've covered launches from Wallet's Flight Facility in Virginia, um, Blue Origin's West Texas facility for New Shepard launches. We've been to Spaceport America for Virgin Galactic. We've been to... Um, Mojave Air and Spaceport for various things. And so a lot of different places around the country and even internationally, because we actually sent someone to French Guiana for the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope recently. So traveling a lot around to bring live coverage of those kinds of events. We also do our live NSF live show, which is kind of a news recap of the week with some Q and A and stuff like that. Um, I also do a very little bit with our video production. So if you've seen our videos from um, Starbase Texas showing what SpaceX is doing pretty much every day, down there. Um, I don't have too much involvement with that, but every once in a while I'll chime in to work on either those videos or different videos that we're putting out as like recorded content for our YouTube channel. Uh, but yeah, mostly coordinating all of those three different aspects and how they all work together to bring uh, complete coverage of all the news events that are going on. Awesome. Um, on the topic of um, going around places um, covering news, um, what, what are some of your favorite places that you've been to? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so obviously I spent a lot of my time here at Cape Canaveral because um, that's just where I live. And so pretty much anything that happens there at the Kennedy Space Center or the Space Force side um, or in Port Canaveral, I'm kind of there. Um, but as far as places I've traveled to, um, I've been to Wallops a couple of times. I've been to Starbase once. Um, and then I've also been to California a couple of times to work. We do a lot of work with Astra Space and bringing their co-producing their official broadcast. And so I've been to Astra's headquarters in California, and that's a very unique um, experience. It's a little bit different from all the other work I do. Um, I think my favorite place and the place that I'm most looking forward to going back is probably Starbase. Um, you can kind of go whenever you want and there's always something happening which is strange you know a lot of times you're supposed to time those trips around a launch or something but uh, if you go to starbase odds are something's going to be happening even if it's building a new vehicle out in the open that you could go watch or if they're actually doing any testing or rollouts and things the one time i went they rolled out uh, ship 20 at the time uh, back out for i think it's second round of testing i didn't plan the trip around that i was there for completely unrelated nasa space flight work but uh, it just so happened that they rolled out of vehicle and I was right next to the road while they rolled it out which is super cool so I think Starbase is definitely the one of the coolest places you can travel to as a space nerd or someone who's interested. 
Brilliant. Um, how long ago did you join NASA Space, um, NASA Space Flight and have you always been the news director? Uh, no, I have not always been the news director. So I first joined NASA Space Flight a little over three and a half years ago, not quite four years ago. Um, and when I joined, I was just a writer. So I was looking out for new news stories. I was talking to the editing team, which at the time was only Chris Bergen and Chris Gebhardt. Um, and uh, at that time, the writing pool was also way smaller. Uh, we had way less writers working for the site. And uh, as new stories popped up, if there was something I was interested in, I would offer to write that up as an article. Uh, my very first article was a update story on um, the New Glenn, Blue Origin New Glenn launch vehicle. And uh, since then, I wrote, I wrote about a couple of different things. Um, and in, right around that time is when the site started to grow a lot, thanks to the YouTube channel, um, when we started really producing those uh, daily Boca Chica updates um, with a lot of help from Mary, who lived down there, giving us the footage. Um, that's what really drove a lot of the growth from at NASA Space Flight since I joined. Um, and so when I joined, the, the pool was a lot smaller, but then over a little bit of time as the site grew, um, we had more people writing and we were putting out more articles, articles more frequently, I should say. Um, and so as the number of writers grew, eventually we needed more people that were able to edit and publish articles. So I originally got promoted to being an editor. And so I joined uh, the editing team along with the two Chris's to help out with that. And then a little bit later after that, um, as the site grew more and more, and especially, especially as we started getting into live broadcast stuff, um, around spring of 2020, we came up with NSF Live and uh, I made the arguable mistake of volunteering to be on the very first NSF Live, and they haven't let me out since. No, I'm kidding. But uh, a lot of appearances on NSF Live and now other live broadcasts as a commentator and things like that um, since then. Um, and so once I got involved with that as well, I kind of became required to kind of mesh all of those different things, video production, broadcast production, and news articles. Uh, kind of combined all that and make sure we were all complementing one another. The articles were promoting the broadcast. The broadcast had access to, you know, if you want to read more, here's the article, stuff like that. Um, and so to kind of help out with coordinating all of that, the NASA Space Flight created the news director position, and I was the very first news director, and I'm now in charge of um, a couple of different editors. We've added more, more of our writers have become editors. So we've got a team of five editors plus myself now for news articles. And then we have, um, oh, I'm sorry, that's a lie, six editors plus myself. Um, and then also the whole team of writers and all the commentators who appear on different broadcasts and things like that. Um, so I've only been the news director for a little under a year at this point. Um, but yeah, so oh, in total, just under coming up on four years in NASA Space Fleet. Brilliant. Wow. Um, quite a long time then. Um, yeah. When and how did you get um, interested in space and space flight like, and that kind of area? Yeah. Um, I first got interested in space flight as a very, very young kid. Uh, my parents liked to show me rocket launches on TV. At the time, of course, the big thing was the space shuttle. Um, so I was watching all of those launches and I was, you know, as a little kid, you just think rockets are cool, right? So I was watching rockets and going, yeah, that looks cool. That, that got me interested, right? Um, and when I was a little bit older, I the Columbia disaster happened actually. And when that happened, uh, the thing that I remember as a young but not super young kid at that point was there was a huge gap after that happened with, um, there were no launches, there were no space shuttle launches, right? Because obviously NASA was working on correcting the issues and making it safer to fly before they flew again. And so when that happened, I remember that gap in, in launches to watch. And when I got a little bit older, eventually I was able to take a trip to the Kennedy Space Center, uh, thanks to my parents. I have to thank them a lot for encouraging and fostering this interest that I had. And at the time, this is actually a funny story, Kennedy Space Center, the tourist attraction, um, was very focused on here's what you can do to be an astronaut, right? Which is kind of the obvious thing. If you want interested in space, you want to be an astronaut. And so, but the whole time I was there, I thought, rockets were scary i didn't really want to get on a rocket because being an astronaut sounds like a scary thing to do and so during the trip i was actually kind of getting less and less excited over the course of the whole trip because everything was about being an astronaut and that's not really what i wanted to do but i was still interested in space towards the end of the tour they took you to the building where they were processing payloads for the international space station new modules to go up and i do not remember off the top of my head what module it was but it was a module that was going to be launched on a space shuttle mission coming up and uh we get to that room and I think I think it was my mom who said, look at all the people in 
in this room, you see all the engineers that are in, you know, the clean room, get up and things like that, working on the modules, getting them ready. And she basically said, all of those people in this room work for NASA. They work on rockets. They work on spacecraft. They work for the space program. And not a single one of them has to get on the rocket at the end of the day. None of them are going, none of them are astronauts. And at that moment, I realized what I wanted to be when I grew up, if you will. Um, I was like, I want to be that. So eventually I learned that the, the word for that was an aerospace engineer. Um, and so that's what decided where I was going to go with my career. Um, and that's how I got interested in the engineering side of things specifically. And then a little bit later, when I was actually in college studying aerospace engineering, the opportunity to join NASA Spaceflight came up. And I've been doing that alongside uh, being an engineering student, uh, which has been a really cool opportunity and a new interest that I've had with communicating about all of this engineering and spaceflight stuff that's going on. So uh, there's, there's the story of how I got to from little kid who thought rockets were kind of cool to now I'm surrounded by it and it's what I think about every day. Brilliant okay um when um what did you do before you joined um, NASA spaceflight and um can you talk a bit more about the job that you do over the top of doing NASA spaceflight? Uh yeah so before I joined NASA spaceflight uh... I was just an aerospace engineering student. I originally went to uh, Texas A&M University uh, studying aerospace engineering. Um, and a couple of years into that, I ended up starting to transfer to my current university, which is Embry-Riddle in Florida. And uh, during that process, I was looking for an additional thing to do to keep myself involved with space flight. Um, and NASA Space Flight put out this um, thing asking for new writers. And so that's kind of how I got involved. Uh, but before that, I was really focused on being an engineering student. I also, at one point, um, worked as a ramp agent. So for those who are familiar with aviation, which is also an interest of mine, even though it's not my maybe career choice for, for down the road, I did work around airplanes a lot. I worked on big cargo 767s for a while. So that was a cool job I had, uh, which actually kind of overlapped with NASA Space Flight a little bit. Um, but right now, so it's NASA Space Flight my engineering studies and then the current position that I have as a student here at Embry-Riddle is an engineer for the suit lab that I mentioned earlier um, and that is a laboratory here at the campus that specializes in um, spacesuit technologies. Uh, the work that I particularly do is for some NASA challenges regarding tools for spacewalks. And so I've had the privilege of last year working on, as a new engineer on the team, designing a quick release mechanism uh, for the XEMU spacesuit, which is NASA's lunar spacesuit. And that's for a program called MicroGNX, which is basically a kind of a student challenge thing where NASA puts out, hey, we're looking for ideas on how to solve this problem that that uh, we're working on for future missions. This program actually has developed tools that have been used on the International Space Station before, and now they're really focused on some Artemis spacewalk kind of stuff. Um, and so that's what I worked on last year. And then this year, I've had the privilege of being the team lead here for the lab, and we're working on a sample marker, which will help astronauts and scientists identify what samples they want to collect on the lunar surface when they're out doing their spacewalk. So that's the engineering work that I currently do. And we're right in the middle right now of our testing phase for that project. And that ultimately culminates in sending some prototypes that the student teams here that I, I'm currently leading, all undergraduate students build these prototypes and send them to NASA and then NASA tests them in the neutral buoyancy lab. So um, I've had a really cool insight into how all that works and had the privilege of being an engineer on those teams and working with some non-engineers, some spaceflight operations folks, some human factors people here at Embry-Riddle University to work on those projects and work on some really cool tools and things. Brilliant. Um, what space? Um, what What do you think um, your future at NASA Spaceflight um, looks like? Um, and do you think you'll carry on being the um, the the news director, or do you think you'll go higher up? Or, or Yeah, well, I mean, there's not much higher up to go at NASA Space Flight. I mean, luckily, I mean, it's a pretty small company, if you will, but uh, the, the, I really, you know, it's a lot of people who are all responsible for various different things. Um, we have our managing editor, Chris Bergen, and the assistant managing editor, Chris Kephart. Both of them have been super helpful in bringing me on board in the first place and allowing me to uh, voice my opinion on, on the future of NASA Space Flight and helping shape what I want our future news coverage to look like. Um, I've also had the great privilege of working with uh, John Galloway, we, who some people know as DOS, uh, Michael Baylor, Jack Byer, um, all of them have kind of been responsible for the video production and broadcast production side of things and working with them has been an absolute pleasure. Um, and then the entire, I mean, the entire writer and commentary team has been fantastic. They're just a great group to want to work with. Uh, um, 
as far as the future of NASA Spaceflight, I think I'll be the news director for the foreseeable future. Um, definitely want to bring some new people in part of this growth. When you grow this fast is you want to make sure you're not bringing people out. Um, a lot of us, you know, kind of eat, sleep and breathe this stuff. And uh, uh, we want to make sure that everyone is happy, keep, keeps the excitement going and is really happy about what we work with. So a lot of what I do uh, these days is helping to make sure that uh, everyone is enjoying the work and doing what they want to do, because I think that it results in the best work. If you're doing a, a job, job uh, that does, you're not excited about, you're not going to do the job as well as you could. I actually remember I was at a conference in DC once and there was a panel by NASA astronaut Kate Rubens and she was talking about her first trip to the International Space Station and she was just so enthusiastic about the research that she was doing and ask anyone who has worked with the astronaut corps and the research that goes on the space station, they'll tell you how high quality the work that Kate Rubens has done in microgravity research is and that's just a one example of a testament of if you are more excited about the work you're doing you'll do that work better um, than someone who is not as excited so i like work with the folks in nasa space flight you know when we bring on new writers we want to ask them um what are you excited about what's the space flight news that gets you most excited because then writing about it they'll produce better news content right um and the same thing goes for all aspects of nasa space flight so um yeah so the future of nasa space flight just um it continuing to expand our coverage, covering more and more things, um, make sure the team is supported and uh, happy to be doing what they're doing. And um, yeah, always just looking for new ways to push for some more transparency in the greater spaceflight industry. A large part of that has been, we've been doing official broadcast with Astra and also with Strata Launch on their aerospace programs. Um, that's been a huge part of bringing new companies or companies that are just starting out flying more and more often um, to help them be a little more transparent with the greater industry, which helps from a couple of different perspectives. Um, things like, um, especially if they're running taxpayer funded programs, you know, taxpayers want to see their tax dollars at work. So, you know, companies that are doing things for NASA or for the Department of Defense, it's always a benefit to bring that to light and let people see what's going on. But also, I think even more importantly, for people who want to get involved with the space flight industry, people who want to be engineers or technicians, astronauts, scientists, business people in the space flight industry, and whatever you want to do to be involved in this part of the world, um, it's great to see events happen in real time. It's great to watch launches live. It's great to watch test flights. Great to do interviews or listen to interviews of people who are already working in the industry and learn about that stuff. And so pushing to do more and more of that uh, as a media agency and bring more of that to be transparent with the world, I think is a great way to get people excited about space flight, to get people motivated to get involved, whether that's an engineer or something else. Um, and uh, that's the the part that gets me most excited about our NASA space flight work. So that's really what I, I focus on going forward is getting people excited like that. Brilliant. Um, that's all the questions I've got for you today. Um, we've got a couple questions from people on, um, on Twitter. So the first one's from Jim. Um, he wants to know, as the NASA Space Flight News Director, um, what are some of the strangest things you've been asked um, by people during like, NASA Space Flight Live and during these kind of launch coverage? The strangest question I've been asked. That is a great question. Um, sometimes there are, I don't want to call them like conspiracy theories because that's too extreme, but like some people, especially within like commercial space flight, right? And you look too closely at things like SpaceX or some of the other like newer space launch companies, some of the small satellite launch companies and things like that. A lot of people um, tend to kind of jump on those things and really root for a particular company and things like that, which in some aspects is great. If you're really excited about the work that let's say SpaceX is doing, um, which you should be, SpaceX is doing a, a lot of really incredible things, right? Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, sometimes though, there are people who take that to the next level and kind of make it like a sports team kind of deal where you're rooting for SpaceX, for example, and I'm, I'm picking on them as an example, but it is not only them. Um, and then, but that means you're rooting against the other commercial companies that they're like competing against, which is strange because from my perspective, you really shouldn't be rooting for a commercial company to succeed. If you're interested in the work that SpaceX is doing, you're probably interested because that is advancing space flight in one way or another. And so if you look at other companies or other government agencies or nonprofits or whoever is also that are also doing work to advance space flight, you should be rooting for them too. Um, so that, that sometimes results in some weird questions like, Recently, we get some questions about like, is the FAA holding up Starship flights so that SLS will fly first? 
that is one of the recent questions that we've been getting way too often. And it's, I don't want to say ridiculous, but it's a little ridiculous. Like that's simply not how the world works. Um, all of these agencies have the kind of same interest in mind. They want to make sure that space flight is advanced safely and as quickly as possible. They want to push the boundaries of American technology and space exploration. And that goes to whether you look at the teams at NASA, in, whether it's the Artemis program or commercial crew or the ISS or any part of NASA, they're all looking to advance space exploration and scientific research, technology development. If you look at a private company like SpaceX, Blue Origin, ULA, all those companies, they're all also looking to advance their technologies and provide new services that will improve space exploration and research. The FAA, one of their main jobs is make sure that all that happens safely. And of course, that's super important because going back to why I got interested in aerospace engineering, if something goes wrong, like I mentioned the Columbia disaster, if something like that happens, that results in a setback to space exploration. You're going to have to wait to make sure it's safe again before you fly again. You might lose political support. And for a government sp funded space program, that's an important thing that you have to keep in mind. You want the American people or what other, other country, if you're going to the European Space Agency or other international space agencies, um, you want the public to be supportive of your program. And that's not going to happen if you mess up something like that. And so I'm motivated to be a good engineer to preserve the public support for the space flight efforts, because I think those efforts are important. And so if you're rooting for space exploration in general, you should be rooting for all of the entities involved to do their job well, because that will result in the coolest and most exciting missions getting to fly. And so to, back, to answer the question, the strangest question I've been asked has been some of those borderline conspiratorial things. These agencies are not fighting one another. Commercial competition is one thing, but they're all working towards the same goals of furthering space exploration and pushing humanity farther into the solar system and beyond. And we should all be rooting for those things together. So there you go. Okay, brilliant answer. Um, on Twitter, someone else um, would like to hear some of your thoughts on the journey from joining NASA Spaceflight as a writer to being one of the stars of their YouTube channel with a whole fan club. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the Thomas fan club that was actually started by a good friend of mine who's a frequent member in the channel, but uh, he, uh, we, we, we knew each other before I even started working in NASA space flight and he's another space nerd. Um, starting the Thomas fan club and that kind of just caught on as a, a running joke that has persisted for years now. Um, but yeah, so I mean, when I started as a writer, yeah, I was kind of just writing about a story maybe once or twice a month. And uh, it was something I was doing very, very part-time um, for, uh, in addition to being an engineering student, which if you're an engineering student, you know, that takes a lot of your time. Engineering student is a more than full-time position on its own. And I was taking on extra responsibilities, which is not an easy thing. And I'm not going to say there's regrets there, but there's definitely been times where I'm like, why am I doing all of this at once? Um, but uh, at the time, yeah, I was just you know writing every once in a while. And it really kind of kicked off with, like I said, the broadcast side of things, doing NSF Live, doing live launch broadcasts. When we started doing that stuff, it became it started taking a lot more of my time. And I got really invested in doing helping out make that broadcast coverage better and better, working with the production team to, you know, you go back to some early NASA space flight broadcasts. We just had, you know, the small NASA space flight logo in the bottom of the corner, nothing too fancy. And now we've got uh, these really cool looking overlays and graphics, and we're doing side-by-side -side cameras with our own cameras and official cameras. And we've got multiple of our, our team members scattered around Cape Canaveral showing you different camera views and things like that. We've got robotic cameras places, especially down in Starbase. Um, that growth has been so, so cool to watch, especially from the inside. And I hope the you find it to um, grow that further and further so the support that we get on the YouTube channel and elsewhere is just super super humbling to show how much people enjoy our coverage and how much they like us to keep growing and showing new new stuff and doing new cool things um, and some of the cool stuff that we're working on right now is super super exciting and I can't wait to be able to share it with everybody so um, yeah that growth has been um, just super, super fun to watch. And uh, nowadays I've got the, in addition to the full-time engineering student gig, which has still not gone away, although I'm getting close to finishing up here. Um, I've now got a another more than full-time gig uh, at NASA Space Flight. I'm still doing that engineering project I talked about earlier here for the university and like all those things combined, I've gotten very, very busy, but it's all doing really, really cool stuff. So um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a, a journey and I, I can't wait to see what comes up here in the future as well with uh, all of those things. 
Brilliant. Um, I can see behind you. Um, this question is about um, Ares One X. Um, what do you think um, uh, makes Ares One X so special? Yeah, you know, I, I've I've mentioned that I'm a fan of the Ares One rocket a little bit uh, here and there. Um, the Constellation program was kind, of, you know, for those who may not be super familiar, is what eventually morphed into. NASA called it the Moon to Mars program, and now it's the Artemis program. Um, but it was NASA's, you know, post shuttle or transition from shuttle way to say, okay, we have built the International Space Station. We have a permanent human presence in low Earth orbit. Now it's time to expand that presence beyond. We're going to go back to the Moon, and unlike Apollo, we're going to stay there, build another permanent human presence, but on the surface of the Moon, in and around the Moon, and then we're going to use that to push off and go on to Mars with humans, right? Um, and so the Constellation was NASA's first real big plan post shuttle to, to do that and Ares 1 was the crew launch vehicle that was going to do that and the reason I just find Ares 1 as a super cool idea of let's build a rocket that can deliver the crew to low earth orbit and then from there regarding depending on what the mission is you'll go to wherever you're going so Ares 1 could launch crew to the International Space Station all on its own you're using the Orion space which has still survived into the Artemis program. In fact, it's kind of the only part that's survived uh, all the way to Artemis. Um, you could also launch an Ares-1 and then launch another rocket that's called Ares-5, which basically one way or another morphed into SLS. It's very similar, um, but just as a cargo vehicle for Constellation. Dock with the moon lander, then go to the moon and go to the moon and back. Um, you could also use Ares-1 to launch to low Earth orbit and dock with a Mars transfer vehicle that you assemble in low Earth orbit and use that to go all the way to Mars with astronauts. So it's the it's one launch vehicle that can go to three different, very different destinations, which I thought was interesting. It was also supposed to be partially reusable. That solid rocket booster, just like for the space shuttle program, was going to parachute down and uh, splash down to be recovered and reused. So that was kind of neat. Um, it's certainly a unique looking rocket. Uh, the first stage is narrower than the upper stage, which you don't see very often. So it was a cool looking rocket. Um, definitely had some engineering challenges. I'm not going to pretend it didn't. Um, there are reasons that the rocket got canceled in favor of Space Launch System, which kind of combines the roles of the two Ares rockets launching crew all the way to the moon, but also launching cargo on future iterations. Um, and of course, you had commercial crew taking over the ISS transport kind of side of things. Um, so it's super interesting to talk about. Um, I'm not going to pretend it's better than the eventual solutions we actually came up with regarding, you know, Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon, Atlas V Starliner, um, the other uh, commercial launch fields that have come up, and as well as the SLS, which is NASA's moon rocket. Um, those all vehicles are all fantastic. And if you did an objective analysis, you come up with all of them are better than Ares 1. So full disclosure, I get that. Um, I just find it a really interesting rocket. And it's one of my favorite rockets to call, uh, call to talk about just because it's so, so cool and unique. Brilliant. Um, one last question. Um, what kind of things do you do in your spare time? In my spare time? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I don't get a whole lot of spare time these days. I've kept myself pretty busy. Um, I'm a pretty big sports fan for those that either follow me on social media or you can also you can look behind me and see some sports teams that I'm allegiant to, if you will. Um, so I do. I'm a pretty big sports fan. I like going to sports events and watching sports. Uh, I'm also, I like playing video games. Of course, if you know me, you can probably guess some of the video games I play. Big Kerbal Space Program fan. <laughs> Um, also a, a big flight simulator fan and things like that. Also play some other random video games, but uh, yeah, I mean, sports is a big interest of mine, playing games with friends, um, and, you know, following along with other engineering projects. I do, I'd mentioned aviation is another big uh, interest of mine. You know, once upon a time, I had wishes of being a pilot and one day that will probably happen, but should probably get this engineering degree out of the way first. So flying is, is something I've definitely interested in as well. Um, and uh, I like to spend my time around airports every once in a while to foster that. So, uh, yeah, it's just a couple of things that uh, I fill in the small gaps I have every once in a while when I'm not busy doing news writing or engineering. I can do some of those things, too. Great. Um, that's all the questions I've got for you today. Thank you so, so much um, for coming on here for the interview. You had some brilliant answers to, um, to my questions and everyone else's questions. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Felix. Uh, thanks for uh, having me on. Always happy to talk about my perspective on space news and space flight in general, and uh, really just an honor to be on. Thanks for having me. Same. It was um, it was great to talk to you, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. You too. Bye. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye.